All right, good morning, you guys. Uh, today we are actually doing a nice little throwback to first semester where we talked about confidence intervals. So today I'm just going back over some of the basics um, and then I'll, I'll add a new layer after our assessment for this cycle. Okay, so first a statistical inference draws a conclusion about a population from evidence provided by a sample. Statistical conclusions are uncertain because the sample is not the entire population. So statistical inference has to not only state conclusions, but also say how uncertain they are. So we use that language of probability to express this level of uncertainty. Okay, so like I said, this is a throwback to first semester where we talked about just basic confidence statements. And my goal was always just to kind of lay in that first layer of understanding so that we can add a few more layers this semester. So first, just a reminder that when we're getting the, the margin of error, we used the quick method. So one over the square root of n, and n is our sample size. Okay, we know that this is only for 95% confidence. Uh, we know that there are other levels of confidence out there, but we have not addressed them yet. They are coming up soon. Okay, so here's my big example to review first semester. All right, in March, the postmaster for a medium-sized city of 100,000 people wanted to plan for the expected crowds filing their tax returns at the last minute. To do this, she decided to estimate the percentage of tax filers who plan to file their returns on April 15th, the last day to file. Using a random digit dialing technique, a group of 1,000 tax filers were interviewed, revealing that 100 of them said it was likely that they would not file until the last day. Identify each of the following. Okay. So first we're looking at our population. So we're looking at our whole group that we are interested in learning about. And in this context, we're looking at residents of this medium sized city. Who file tax returns. Okay, so again, your population, we're thinking about what is the whole group that we want information from. Okay, for B, we're looking at our parameter, right, little P right here. So here we're looking at the proportion of our population who feel a certain way about whatever issue we're talking about, or in this context, the proportion of these residents in this medium-sized city who plan on filing a tax return on the last day. Let me write that out. All right, so the proportion of, I'm just gonna write it as the population that we saw above. So the proportion of the population who plan on filing the tax return on the last day. Okay, I also want to remind you that we often do not know the population parameter, right? That's what we're trying to estimate. That's what we're trying to predict. So I'm going to add that to our notes here as well. So we often do not know the population parameter. All right, our sample, right, our sample is a subgroup of the population. We're always hopeful that it was taken at random, right? It should be a nice cross-section of all the types of individuals in our population. And in this context, we're looking at the 1,000 residents of this city
who file tax returns. Okay, and then our statistic, right, that's that P with a funny little hat, like that P hat. Here we're looking at the proportion of our sample who feel a certain way about whatever issue we're looking at. So in the context here, we're saying it is the proportion of our sample, right? So tax filers in this medium sized city, and we can calculate that. We know it's 100 out of the 1000, so 10%. who plan on filing on that very last day. All right, so let me pause for a moment and just make sure that we are super clear. So population, that is the whole group that we want information from. Our parameter is the number that describes it. So it's the proportion of the population who are gonna file on that very last day. We do not know the population parameter. We are always trying to predict it, to estimate it, based on information from a known sample. So our sample is a subgroup of that larger population. We are so hopeful that it is representative of that larger population, should be selected at random. And our statistic is the figure that represents the sample. In this context, it is the proportion of the residents in this medium-sized city who file tax returns who are gonna file on that very last day. And we know that that figure is 10%. Okay, our margin of error, let me just slide it up a little bit. Okay, so our margin of error is one over the square root of N. N is our sample size, so I'm gonna plug in a 1,000 right here. So one over the square root of 1,000. So that will give us about plus or minus 3.1623% as our margin of error. Okay, and then I'm just going to talk a little side note here that we will learn a more precise method uh, over the next few days. So we will learn a more precise formula or method calculation soon. All right, so like I keep saying, I'm just trying to refresh you on some of the fundamentals. We're gonna have more layers coming in soon. All right, so writing us a confidence statement really comes in two parts. The first part is saying, well, this is what I know, right? According to the survey, according to the poll, this is what I concretely know based on what my sample has shown me. So in this case, we're gonna say, well, according to the poll, uh, 10% of residents of this medium-sized city plan to file on the last day. Okay, so again, According to the poll, we're saying this is the source of our data, and then this is what we know. 10% of residents of a medium-sized city, that's what our sample is telling us, they're going to file a tax return on the last day. Okay, and then we say in our second statement, we're trying to abridge that, extend that to the larger population. So we're going to say here, we are 95% confident. Uh, that the true population parameter OK, 
it will fall within plus or minus 3.1623% of this result. Okay, so again, two statements. First part, we're saying this is what we concretely know based on the sample that we have obtained. So according to the poll, 10% of residents of a medium-sized city, they plan to file their tax return on the very last day. And now we're trying to extend that to the larger population. We throw in how confident we are. Right now, we've only been living in a 95% confidence world. We will learn other levels soon. So we're saying we're 95% confident that the true population parameter will fall within, here's my margin of error, plus or minus 3.1623% of this result. So we're essentially taking that margin of error, we're attaching it to the statistic of 10%, right? So we're trying to say, well, here's my statistic plus or minus the margin of error, right? We expect that that true parameter should fall within this window that we've created. Okay, so now use basic language to explain the concept of 95% confidence. So the idea is, well, if we take many samples, right, we've gathered a lot of data, we expect that in 95 of, of 100, right, 95% of the time, our true population parameter should fall within this window right here. So let me write that out. So if we take many samples, Ninety-five percent of them will have the true population parameter within this window that we've created which is the statistic with the margin of error attached. So that's the window right there that I keep talking about. So building off our statistic of 10%, we're adding and then subtracting that margin of error. That is our window that we expect our population parameter to fall within. Okay, we are, we're never certain. Right? There's never any guarantees, right? We really don't know if we're part of the 95% of the time that we are you know, on target or if we're part of that 5% of the time that we are just off. All right, let me read that back, right? So the idea again is if we take a lot of samples, we got a lot of data, we know that in 95% of them, so 95 out of every 100 samples that were selected at random, we know that the true population parameter should be within this window that we've created. What is the window? The window is the statistic that we've obtained with that little cushion on either side, the margin of error attached to it. We can never be totally certain, right? We could be part of that 95% of the time that we, we hit the target or part of the 5% of the time that we miss the target. We really never know, which is why we always make our statements with this level of confidence. All right, and again, just remember that our whole goal here is to make predictions, to make estimations about that whole population, but based on a subset of data from a sample.
All right. Uh, what sample size do you need for a margin of error of 3%? All right, so here our margin of error is 3%. What would be our sample size? So here we just have an algebra problem. So 1 over the square root of n is equal to 0 0.03. So first thing that I would do is I would clear my fraction. So multiply each side by the square root of n. So I have 1 is equal to 0 0.03 times the square root of n. Okay, divide each side by 0 0.03. So now I have the square root of n is equal to 1 divided by 0 0.03. Let me show you what that looks like in my calculator. So here we go. 1 divided by 0 0.03. Okay, so 33 and a third. And then I can go ahead and square each side. So n will be that 33.33, 33rd squared. So n is about 1,111.1111, right, point one recurring. But we'd round to the nearest whole number. So we'd say that that would be about 1,111 individuals. All right, should be all good to hear. Let's take a moment, let's flip it over. And here, all I'm doing is giving you some multiple choice concepts to review. And these are all problems that we did do first semester. So let me flip to that second page. All right, here we go. So multiple choice review. All right, first up, the conclusion of a confident statement always applies to the population and not the sample, and that is absolutely true. Okay, we know the sample statistic. We want to estimate the population parameter. Let me add that. So we know the sample statistic. P hat and want to estimate the population parameter P. All right, our conclusion about the population is never completely certain, also true. Right, we can offer no guarantees. We know, again, that we can be part of that 95% of the time that we hit our target or part of that 5% of the time that we miss. Okay, for three in the real world, it's usually, it's usual to report the margin of error for 95% confidence. Absolutely true. Anytime you read something about a political poll, that is typically what they are working with and the margin of error ends up being about two or three percentage points. Okay, um, other confidence levels that we'll talk about pretty soon, we're going to talk about 90% and 99% confidence. So we'll see these levels show up soon, but like I always say, right now we're living in that 95% confidence world. Okay, for four, a sample survey can choose a confidence level other than 95%, but the cost of higher confidence is a larger margin of error. Okay, this is also true. So this is where you should remember my butterfly net. Let me write that. Remember the butterflies. Right, to be more confident we must use a larger net. So let's say that, for example, my statistic is coming in at uh, 50%. So let's picture here, here's that 
okay, with a margin of error attached to it. And here's that 50% with the margin of error attached to it. Okay, so here again, that's my statistic. I'm just picturing it right smack right there in the middle, and then I've attached a margin of error. So which one would you be more confident with, right? The bigger net, the bigger window for it to fall in. So this one would be an example for 95% confidence, and this would be something wider, like a 99% confidence. So to be more confident, we must use a larger net, right? Remember the butterflies. So to be more confident, use a larger net. Right, we think of the butterflies. All right, what's next? All right, for B, uh, if we take many simple random samples from the same population, we expect, so for A, the same values of the statistic for each sample, so that would be like if I took multiple samples and my, my true parameter is say 50%, that I keep getting statistics that are the same, that are like all 50%, right? That's not necessarily true, right? I should get uh, a bunch of statistics that are clustering around where the true population parameter is, but they're not always going to match. So when I read B, that's really saying what I'm trying to say uh, in, in, in explaining why A is not right. So for B, the values of the statistic will vary from sample to sample. That makes sense, right? There's some natural variation in the samples that are obtained. So let's pretend that our true parameter is at 50%. I could go out and get a bunch of samples and I'm hoping that they're gonna cluster around that 50%, right? I might get a sample with a statistic of 49 or 51 or 48 or 52, and I'm sure I get a bunch that are exactly 50. Right? The idea is it's going to cluster around where the truth actually falls, but every once in a while we might get one that's a little bit off. Right? I could have a statistic that's a little low or a little high, right? but there's going to be some natural variation in the samples that we obtain. Let me remind you of that language. So natural variation in the samples obtained. So B is looking pretty good to me right now, but let me just read through the others. So for C, a different value of parameter for each sample. Well, our parameter is what the truth actually is, and we usually do not know it. It's what we're trying to estimate, what we're trying to predict based on the sample. So C does not work. Uh, for D and E, talking about voluntary response or bias, well, we should be using an SRS. We should be using a random sample anyways. So D and E do not apply. So B is great. That's our best choice right there. Okay, in a study, uh, it is most important to, well, we, we don't want any bias. We don't want a lot of variability as well. We want it to be just right. So get rid of any bias where we're seeing that our results are consistently off and in the same direction. And we don't want our variation to be uh, too excessive. Right? I don't want to get statistics that are coming in too widespread. I want them to be pretty tightly packed around where the truth actually is. So I'm loving C right now. We want to reduce both bias and variability. Using random sampling is great. That's a solution for reducing our bias. Okay, so for seven, uh, to reduce bias, I, I think I just answered it, to reduce bias, we want to make sure that we're using randomization. So be sure to use the best random sampling scheme. We usually call that an SRS. So C looks great right now as well. Let me slide up to the rest. All right, for eight, in order to reduce variability, one should, well, we should have a, a large sample size. Right, so when we're doing a political polling or public opinion polling, we usually are asking about a thousand individuals. So we wanna make sure that we have a decent sample size. If we increase our sample size, that is going to reduce variability. Okay, for nine, uh, using a, a larger sample size, how does that impact the margin of error? Okay, well, let's look at how we calculate the margin of error. So one over the square root of N. So if I have a bigger sample size, if I have a bigger number here, 
that means that I'm dividing one by more parts. It's going to create a smaller number overall. So using a larger sample size, making the number here bigger, will have a smaller margin of error overall. So decreases that margin of error. Okay, when we say that the newspaper poll is biased, right, statistical bias, what we're saying, so before even looking at my choices, we're saying that we are consistently off and in the same direction. So if I read through my results really, or my options really quickly, I would have to say the only one that makes sense is choice A, right? So repeated polls are consistently off and they're consistently off in the same direction. So they're consistently overestimating what the truth is or consistently underestimating what the truth is. Okay, for 11, if we wanna be more confident, so if we wanna increase the confidence level from 90 to 95%, what does that do to the margin of error? So remember, we already kinda of talked about this earlier on, to be more confident, we have to use a larger net. We think of the butterflies. So our margin of error will increase. Let me write that little side note. To be more confident, we must use a larger net. All right, and then uh, what happens to the sample size if you wanna cut the margin of error in half? So we're assuming that every other constraint is the same, but we just want the margin of error to be cut in half. So what I'm kind of picturing is, let me make myself a little example. Let's picture that our margin of error is uh, 0 0.05. And that would be a sample size of 400 individuals. So let's imagine that that's our starting point and 0.05 would be 1 over 20. So just looking at it as a fraction, 1 over 20. So I'm saying, okay, well, let's take half of the margin of error and see what that does to the n value and is our sample size. So let me plug in that margin of error of 1 over 20. And I'm going to keep it as a fraction for a reason. I think it just helps you see how we impact our sample size. Okay. So right here, I want to I want to solve for n. So here, what I would do is I would cross multiply. So over here, I have a, a set of fractions that are being multiplied. So I can picture this as just one big fraction bar like that. And then I'm really just cross multiplying like a basic proportion. So square root of n times 1 is just the square root of n. And then over here, 2 times 20 times 1 is still the 2 times 20. I know that's 40. I'm just keeping it as 2 times 20 right now, again, for a reason. And now I want to solve for n. So to unlock that square root, I can square each side. That 2 goes to both items on the inside. So now n, my sample size, is 2 squared times 20 squared. So 4 times 400. Remember that the 400 was the original sample size. So now it's going to be four times larger. So it's going to quadruple. If I had said that I want the uh, margin of error to be one third of its original value instead, I would end up having a three here. The three would get squared and it would be nine times larger. Let's say that I wanted a margin of error that is one fourth of its original value. I would have had a four right here. Four squared is 16, it would be 16 times larger, right? So these are things that we have to um, kind of balance out. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to have a smaller margin of error if it means that it's gonna be more costly to go out and get more people to participate in my study? Right? So it's always this balancing act, and that's why in the real world, we typically have a polling that is about 1,000 individuals, 95% confidence, with a margin of error that's around 2 or 3%. All right, that's all I got for today. Again, just a nice refresher of uh, confidence statements, all the stuff that we talked about a lot first semester. Have a good rest of your day.